Great. Thanks, Christoph. And a wonderful course. Second year with you and Saqib and John. And you really have a fantastic faculty here. Uh, you got Tony Young to come here this year, so that's amazing uh, from Phoenix. But really, uh, my hat's off to you. Like, as, as one of the older people in the room, I think only Tony, maybe Jen, or you, you might be older than me, maybe Paul and I are the same age, but uh, we're just about the oldest folks in the room. So I've been tasked with talking about fusion. Um, here are my disclosures. And, you know, this is really fascinating because, you know, uh, Ray, you said, what, endocurious people? Um, you know, the folks listening today are going to be excited about endoscopic regardless. So I don't need to delve into why this is so important. But I think people out there do watch these uh, videos, which I don't really particularly like. Uh, this is a professional audience. But patients get a hold of this stuff. I think it's important to understand that our field is undergoing transition. And the evolution uh, leads to two sides. One is growth of one group and demise of another. So I like to show this, and I know if this is repetitive, I'm, I apologize, but this is a slide about Baumol's cost disease, which is an important concept, looking at the issue of what happens uh, over time with technology. That is, everything gets cheaper, better, safer, like cars, but only two outliers here, college tuition and medical care being those outliers that are, are not really meeting the standards of our society. So I think about this from the perspective of, you know, well, here we are in Seattle, right? Home of Microsoft, Costco, Boeing, Amazon. And this is the cost of an iPad 2. Uh, if you were to reduce this back into time, going back just a number of decades, you'd see that the cost of an iPad 2, which is $160 today on Amazon, would be something like uh, $40 trillion uh, back when I was born. So this is what we're not doing, right? So we are not getting better at what we do. But this group, the people talking about endoscopic, for the last day or so, 24 hours, you guys have been discussing things that are interested in changing society, medicine, and how we provide care to our patients. So again, this is what keeps me up at night, these existential threats. Meng's probably so sick of seeing this slide about the dinosaurs, <laughs> that these existential threats are going to wipe out spine surgery in this gooby dooby video that was just released. And you know, look, I had a whole neurosurgery podcast on this, trying to wipe out our field, saying what we do, do doesn't work. What we do works, right? In the right patients, done for the right reasons, 90% of the time, 80% of the time, maybe in extreme case, 70% of the time, it works, right? But people are afraid of us. Society is afraid that it costs too much. There are a lot of factors going on here that are, are aligned to, to work against us, right? So my focus the last 15 years has been aging populations, like in South Florida, increasing comorbidities in our patients, increasing obesity, in, in escalating costs of care, uh, increased fear of spine surgery, and all those things that have led me along the journey uh, way behind Tony Young about how we get smaller and smaller and smaller. But when people talk about this, everybody says they do MIS, right? Everybody says, I do an MIS fusion, right? I, I do this, I do that, right? Everybody's advertising what they can do. I don't like that because this is what it's become, the idea that if you use a tube, you're doing MIS surgery. Now, I understand the idea there, right? That you're saying, well, I have a tubular retractor, MIS T-lift. But you guys know we're going to go home, and you're going to see people at your institution, which are all excellent institutions, forget about substandard places. And you're going to say, well, what size tube are you using for an MIS T-lift or some sort of fusions, right? And you, do you, anybody know what the average size tube is? Mark, you know. You, you're the expert in all this stuff. Yeah. I mean, the average size is going to be an 18 for a decompression, 22 or beyond. Yeah. 22 would be like the smallest you'd normally, I know people can go smaller, but most people I see doing MIST, if they're using 26, something huge, right? So that's, is that really MIS? So this really changed when I started on this journey, kind of following Tony. This is a, this is a endoscopic users meeting with over a thousand surgeons in attendance in China. So why are they doing this better than this? Why, why are we not doing this in the US and why are we such a small group of people? So started to go deep into this, this idea of Kanban's triangle, a transformal approach. What is Kanban's triangle really? Lou Toomey Allen from Barrow and I did this together, this concept of the prism. And then we started to, to chart out, like, what is it to access to spine through Cambins. What are the different access routes that Cambins is not just Cambins, there's different routes through it. Because we wanted to get something different. Uh, I know we've been speaking mostly about endoscopic decompression. We wanted to get to something like what Ray said is the bigger surgeries. How do we get to those surgeries so we can do a bigger operation through a smaller, smaller footprint, as, as uh, Muhammad was talking about? And he, he, he briefed uh, you on a lot of this stuff. I think Muhammad does this much more elegantly than I do. But these were the six pieces we put together, which is the endoscope, of course, awake anesthesia, percutaneous fixation, the expiral. So you've, you're hearing recurrent elements of this inner body that's expandable and osteobiologics, the idea being something like this to do the cases quick 
quickly, efficiently, reliably, with low variance. So people could say, well, I'm just going to have this surgery done, and it's just going to be A, B, C, D. And if the indications were correct, the odds of a success are going to be something in a 90% range. That was the goal of all this. I'm not saying I've achieved that, but that's the goal. And this is, the, I know you guys have seen, this is the first case I ever did in 2013. You can see I'm talking to the patient. We're going to do a fusion, inner body fusion, T-lift, just like you would expect to see, at least on X-ray, a standard open or MIS T-lift, right? And I don't want to belabor the point. Doesn't doesn't show up well up there. And this is what it looks like. So you know, if you can do this with you know, without narcotics, with no spinal epidural, minimal tissue disruption. Uh, I'm sorry, these videos aren't running, but this is just the patient right after surgery walking around two hours afterwards uh, feeling pretty decent with an operation like that. And we publish this a lot. This, there, I don't want to recite all the various elements of, of what we've done with this, but the idea is that with the right protocols, you can get this done properly. This is our UM protocol. I know it's too much to cover. We could spend a, a couple hours just on this alone. We've heard some great discussion. Mark was talking about propofol, no propofol. What do we use? We generally use propofol ketamine. We don't use any narcotics in the process. Um, but the patients do have to be uh, sedated a bit. We actually have a paper on BIS monitoring coming out. We've been using BIS as a tracking mechanism. That's bispectral monitoring the brain, right? But why do this? And you've heard this already. It's the, it's the best neuromonitoring, right? Reduce effects on cognitive cognition, fewer physiologic derangements. You can, you can treat, as, as Mohammed showed, these ASA3 patients, right? And then you can be super efficient, right? So it's really important to understand that the DRG is, is a little different. So for those uninitiated, when you're doing transframinal work, the dorsal root ganglion is not the exiting nerve root. It is part of it, but it is something quite unique, and its monitoring thresholds are quite different. Its tolerances for stress and strain are different, and we've published on this. If you're going to monitor, if you're going to do this blindly, you're going to use electrophysiologic parameters. Uh, I think um, Yinda Lee, I think, wrote that paper up uh, about what kind of monitoring you would use. But this is just showing what it looks like. So we're talking to the patient. She's giving us a thumbs up, saying we're ready to roll with the operation. And then we're going to access through a Cambin's 3A type approach, which is coming directly into the disc as if you're doing a discogram or something of that sort. So when we talk about the targeting and the access and all that, um, Ooh, these are not running. Okay, none of the videos are running. Okay, well, anyhow, when we're talking about targeting and access, the idea is accessing through Cambins. You really need to get to a point where you can get close to the center of the disc. So this means that you're primarily dealing with the, 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 the facet joint. The biggest parameter on whether or not you can reach the center of the disc through an approach that's unlikely to impinge on or get near the dorsal root ganglion is really the size of the facet joint. So really hypertrophy joints, those make the approach lateralized. The lateralization of the approach brings you closer to the DRG, increasing risk, because the only structure at risk in these surgeries is the DRG. Really, there's nothing else at risk. You're not going to tear the dura. You're not going to get in the aorta. You're not going to hurt anything important except the DRG. So the DRG, to me, is really the point here. Discectomy and decompression. Is this last year's slides? I feel like I'm talking about last year's slide. Discectomy and decompression. None of the videos are running, Linda. So anyhow, the discectomy and decompression and automated devices here for getting this done. Sorry. <laughs> automated devices getting this. And this is what you want to see. With the, with the aid of the endoscope, you're actually seeing the end, of the, the end plate bone, right? And the cartilage is the end plate removed. Now, why is this so critical? Well, we are really relying heavily on indirect decompression. The biggest concern we had was non-union, right? Non-union, uh, and in our early series, we did see early cage migration. In fact, if you, if you peruse the literature deeply, you'll find that the Europeans went through this journey as well, and they backed out of it because they said, look, this early cage migration problem is a concern. So in our early series, we did see some early cage migration. So now what we do is we use the endoscope to get access. We do automated cleaning, as you see here. And then after we're done with the cleaning, we go back with the endoscope to ensure we have bony contact. In other words, that bony contact reduces significantly the rate of early cage extrusion and, of course, non-union thereafter as well, right? So here's, here's a good paper showing this in terms of open versus MIS, right? So we all know as, as experts, but maybe not everybody listening knows this, but getting a good disc removal is exceedingly complicated and difficult. So if you're a master T-lift surgeon, right, you can probably take out, what, 50% of the disc, right, after working for 20 minutes. So what are you able to do with the endoscope? Well, 
This kind of shows, and this is kind of nice, it shows MIS versus open, and these four quadrants of success of disk removal. And here you can see there are differences, although they're quite similar with the MIS approach. But remember with MIS, you have the ability to use large instruments, you have the ability to translate your position, things you really cannot do as well with the endoscope because you're primarily relying on rotation and angulation with endoscopic surgery, right? So this relies, uh, this, this requires, I should say, the, the surgeon to be more attentive to the detail of how you take disc, because the inability to translate, right, six degrees of freedom, right, that's space, right, four in translation, two in rotation, the idea is that you have a limitation in translation with the ultra MIS surgeries as we're doing here. But when you do that well, right, you're able to get excellent, excellent achievement of all these kinds of metrics. For example, this is a very, very complicated case in the sense that this lady has multi-level disease, right? And here we go with the idea, right? All the endocurious folks, right, Ray? They're like, well, how do I how do I get the silver bullet? How do I just strike it where she has the most problems? And you can see it's the L4-5 spondylolisthesis with the hypertrophy ligament. And if you can get indirect decompression and stabilization, pre and post-op improvement of stenosis without actually directly taking much of that out anyways, right? This is really kind of the goal of the ultra MIS endoscopic fusion to do this surgery so efficiently that you're not as worried about these things. And I've, I've done this well over 400 times. We, we have our series published. The new series will be coming out in um, Journal Neurosurgery Spine. But Again, look here, this is the big one. Transient, permanent, DRG, those are the killers, right? So I always tell people, you know, in the OR, I'm kind of chicken shit. I don't like to have complications. I'd rather live to fight another day. This is the one thing I worry about. I don't want to tickle or hurt that DRG. Even if I don't get any stimulation on it, I'm gonna find that some people are gonna wake up with some irritation. Almost always gets better, but it doesn't always get better, right? The whole idea is it's trade-off. There's no true solutions, only these trade-offs in terms of our surgeries. Now, what about the economics and efficiencies on this? So this is quite important, right? So this is a um, discussion of the cost of surgery. I put this slide together back in 2002, and the idea is there's a cost of surgery, and this is what people are really afraid of. This cost can be measured economically, socially, psychologically, societally, but it's a real cost of doing a real operation. Now, this is a slide from 02. Now, we started talking about bending the cost curve, right, like this, and getting it down to the level where it's like background noise. This is an important concept because that's one of the major uh, friction points of people coming to surgery. And this is a slide from 2012. Now, let me talk to you about something that John Yoon, who's in the room, uh, who, who presented this morning, has been doing, which is this objective activity tracking. I know, uh, Christoph, you've been doing this with the Spine Healthy app. This is a paper from Stanford looking at real granular data on how people are behaving, right? And, you know, we use a different method, John and I, which is not using smartwatches, but using the cell phone data to track all the activity. And this is just an example of a patient who, uh, who John put this together, patient has declination activity due to disease process. Guess what? That's what we're treating, right? So now we're gonna do a surgery and right after surgery, the patient's gonna be very still and boom, after surgery, return to baseline, right? And then for a long period of time, about a year, and then actually declination, at this point, actually the patient developed pancreatic cancer. Very, very powerful granular data, right? You actually get a, a, a real biopsy on a, on a temporal nature of every hour of the patient, right? So let me show you a slide that is important because it will be very scary or very insightful for the people listening. This is from uh, the cover of Journal of Neurosurgery. John, you did this, you published this paper, right? This is two patients. Red is endoscopic fusion, blue is a micro decompression. This is, we call this, John, you call this what? Phenotyping, right? Recovery phenotyping, disease phenotyping, surgery phenotyping. What this shows, and this is, this is not all patients, this is not an average, this is just two cases, that you take a non-fusion recovery process and you make a fusion recovery process look like that. That's a very, very dangerous statement in the wrong person's hands, a very compelling and powerful statement, whether you're an insurer, a stakeholder in the healthcare system, a nurse, or a patient, right? This is important because this changes everything potentially about how we do surgery. Narcotic usage, this is uh, MIS T-lift versus endoscopic T-lift. Purple is the MIS T-lift. Uh, orange is the awake T-lift in terms of narcotic usage, right? And then 
We know this is a problem, right? We have uh, over 100,000 Americans dying a year from this. Real issue, we're getting blamed for a lot of this. What about cost, right? This is important, you know, real cost data is so hard to get. Mohammed, we gotta talk about this because you got cost data too, it's amazing. Very few people have cost data. This shows our cost data here. This is for the ERAS or AWAKE fusion versus the MIS fusion. We bring the cost down 16% uh, from 22,000 to 19,000. Now, for those of you who are smart enough to understand, this is what allows us to survive any kind of healthcare revolution, right? We are below the metric of bundling. We are the, below the metric of Trump care, Obamacare, Biden care, Kamala Harris care. I don't care who comes next. <laughs> we are gonna be surviving that with some level of profitability, which actually, let's be honest, most people are not gonna survive that, right? Which is, when I say that for the young people in the room, I hope you're awake now because that means that there may be no future for your career, right? If you can't, because you're, you're just costing money. You're a cost center. You're not a profit center. Nobody wants you anymore. You're just costing everybody money. Every surgery you do is recurrent added cost, not benefit for, your, for whoever your employer is. This is very important. Now, what about that? What about, what about things that you care about? Maybe you say, well, I don't care about that. I'll be fine. I'm independently wealthy, right? I'm like Tony Young. I'm good. I don't need to worry about anything anymore. Well, I care about my time. Time is the most valuable commodity I have. So here's an example of two cases uh, on two different days, right? Right? One's a standard uh, MIS TLF, the other's a wake TLF, and I'll just show you this. I'm sorry if this is repetitive for people who've seen it before. Both cases in the, in the OR start at 725. Again, two different days, two different patients, right? These are not a race, two rooms. This is uh, patient both going in at the same time. I re select these randomly. Prep start 749 versus 732. Why is this? Uh, we've heard already in the last couple talks, Paul was talking about patient flipping themselves over. So I've saved myself now 17 minutes on the prep. That's just cleaning the back. Then how about incision? Procedure start 8 o'clock. That's not bad, right? 8 o'clock is pretty awesome. Does Harborview do 8 o'clock? <laughs> Don't make me laugh, right? Jackson Memorial, same thing, right? How about here, 7.38, okay, that's the incision time. Now I've saved myself 22 minutes. Now, procedure finished, 10.56 versus 8.30. 126 minutes, that's over two hours now. And guess what, you gotta get out of the room, you gotta wake the patient up. 1106 versus 835, that means I'm 151 minutes ahead of myself. That's two and a half hours before um, the other surgery. So this is really compelling for time if you care about time, and it's not all about time because there's, there's quality related to that. But it's important in terms of access, in terms of cost, in terms of danger of anesthesia, in terms of danger of procedure, blood loss, right, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the bottom line is, you know, what are the next stages? Well, there's a lot of things coming. Robotics, right, we've written about this, we've talked about this. And what does that really mean in terms of robotics? Using augmented reality, endoscopic robotic surgery, which we published on as well. And then how about deformity surgery? And this is just showing you a case. I like to show this case because it's, you know, kind of give you an idea what it looks like to do a three-level endoscopic in just about two hours. And it's, you know, look, people look at this, Chris Schaff or Jens Chapman walk in there and back in and say that's not a real deformity. But the reality is we're coming after that. We're going after that. The uh, population is aging. We need more and more help for these people. They're older, they're sicker, they're, they're less tolerant of everything we do. And of course, adding lower doses, right? This is one of the big, big challenges we have with all of our MIS procedures, and we are getting there. All the solutions are being provided. I see a lot of people in this room are part of that journey. So very exciting, uh, amazing course, uh, and, and thank you for having me. This is really, um, Christoph, my hat's off to you. You know, your, 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 your progress, you've, you, you know, I remember the first cases I did in endoscopic we did together. You were a fellow, I was an attending, and I had, and you taught me during that time. So you've really assembled a fantastic group here. It's, it's my hat's off to you. And of course, Tony, the great grandfather of all of us. Thank you. Uh, Mike, so th thanks for that. Uh, a quick question. Um, so you, you talk about saving money with your ARAS TLF versus your MIS TLF. Um, but your ARAS TLF has a bunch of toys that cost money. So where's the main savings coming from? So in that paper, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's in neurosurgery literature, Ray. So, no, go, please, please, John. Um, so it's actually true that the ERAS TLF costs more. For, for, if you look at the paper, and I'm sorry, I didn't put it all up there. If you break it down, the actual um, you know, implants, disposables, the expert, all that, make it a little bit more expensive on that side, but there's so much savings on the medication management, and, the, and it really is the outliers. One person ends up having urinary retention, goes to I, another person goes to ICU, you get that one in 10, and then boom, the, 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 it changes everything on the averages, right? 
It's also the, it's a lack of variance which is really critical. Thank you.